my name is uh, Marco Corbetta, Senior Technical Director. My name is Misha Koper, Lead Environment Artist on the Organics team. Uh, and I'm Ali Brown, uh, Director of Graphics Engineering. And we are going to talk right, about the evolution of Planet Tech today. Initially, um, our goal was to achieve a seamless transition between space and planets. So we'll fly to a distant planet, land on it, and explore its entire surface with no loading screens. So looking up at the planets in the sky and fly up to them is cool, but what are the planets supposed to look like and how can we create them? So initially, I just started doing some tests, mixing procedural terrain with buildings. Here is another early picture showing procedural terrain with no mountains. Um, while we were getting so, some very interesting results during our early test, a key factor in Star Citizen is that we have a specific universe with pretty deep law. So we cannot just generate you know, random planets. We needed artist input to match the reference and law. So um, we had multiple layers of noise and some generic elevation maps. Shading and colors were based on procedural rules, elevation and slope. Um, we had an initial editor integration with real-time editing of basic planet properties and atmosphere. So after a lot of hard work, we got our first version V1 working. Here you can see our first man on the planet. And here is the first spaceship on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Successful landing. Exactly. So after V1, we introduced uh, procedural and artistic improvements. During V2, we introduced the concept of ecosystem. So the ecosystems are a combination of terrain maps with visual objects and gameplay properties. Um, each ecosystem had a three channels color textures used for blending texture layers, and we used the same channels for object scattering as well. Um, using ecosystems, we could make each planet unique, matching the law, but still generating planet size uh, content for players to explore. So, uh, V2 shipped with Alpha 3.0. We had the new moons and landing zones. We had seamless transitions, details visible from space all the way down to the surface. We basically rewrote the entire 3D engine terrain system to work at scale and on a spherical planet. Uh, Alpha 3.0 was multiplayer ready. You could already explore planets online with your friends. You could do flight formations and planet side battles. Um, the planet generation is synchronized between client and server. The physics collision mesh is generated on demand. Um, we will talk a bit more about this later. This picture is showing the sense of scale we achieved with Alpha 3.0. As you can see here, we are zooming in from a solar system down to a planet surface. Here's plan uh, Daemon, planet view from space. While zooming in, we start seeing high level formations and ecosystems. Getting closer, objects are starting to appear. Next. Okay. Um, here is the space, the ground to space transition for Yela. We're showing additional elements like uh, icy surface from space. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is the other way around, zooming out from ground to space. Okay, with version three, we decided to introduce more uh, artistic control. Here we can see the artistic improvements made to Yella in version three. 
version 3 shipped with Alpha 335. We added new moons and new planets, including a city planet cover with buildings. We introduced real day night cycles, so planets are actually rotating in real time. And we made a large amount of tools improvements and built a new vegetation system. In V3, we increased from three channels to 16 channels using alpha values to encode the material IDs. But blending these 16 texture layers for each pixel would be way too expensive. So we found a, a very fast solution by blending only the closest surface using temporal differing. So here we have several layers combined with, with each other, but without smooth blending. And here we're blending 60 layers at once using temporal differing. So it's basically at the cost of blending only one layer. So what would be the next steps after version 3? We had the desire for something quicker to generate with less uh, direct artistic control like we had previously in V2, but still being able to influence terrain shape and colors like in V3. We want a smaller ecosystem to get more details, improve blending and transitions. But still, we need to take into account special planets like Arcorp. So, enter planets V4, our final version. We decided to go for a more physically based approach. We wanted to improve on ecosystems blending and transitions. And now I'm handing over to Michel to give us an overview of V4. Thank you, Marco. Um, I hope this clicker holds up because uh, there seems to be some interference. So, um, like I said, I'm the lead artist on the organics team. Um, our team works with the, the planet tech tool day in, day out. Uh, all the planets you've seen so far have been created uh, by the team in DE. Um, so we had some uh, thoughts and demands when, whenever we talk about tools and what we want to improve. So why V4? Um, Let's go over some of this stuff. So why V4? Up until now, the, for a long time, our focus has been on moon landscapes. Um, and although these are visually distinct from each other, um, they're essentially a single biome uh, planetoid. Um, the, the one is desert, one is icy, one is a lunar landscape. But uh, the biggest difference is, is actually like the type of assets that you see, the shapes and the terrain. Um, last year, when the team uh, started to work on Hurston, we we're actually confronted with our biggest challenge yet. Um, Hurston is a very diverse planet uh, in terms of what we've done so far. So we have uh, dry wastelands, we had our mining pits, um, we have trash yards, we have hot acidic areas, and even very lush green areas. Um, so there's, on a single planet, we had to cover a lot of variety. Um, and this clearly proved a challenge. So based on, on this experience working on, on Hurston, we, uh, we started to think about, okay, what can we do to improve our where are our bottlenecks and how can we proceed? Um, so we <laughs> wanted to make sure that we future-proof the technology because up until now it's been Stanton, but there's, uh, this, we want to go somewhere, right? We want to go to other locations and the only way to do it is to work faster, more e efficient. Um, so V4 is a fundamental change in how fast uh, we can build planets. Uh, keeping what worked well, um, reworking the things that slowed us down, and uh, building a tool that's in-engine and is a very intuitive, artist-friendly tool to use. And uh, we'll show some examples of that um, coming up. Uh, yes, all right, cool, seems to work. So here's an example of some of the stuff that we wanted to achieve, or at least wanted to do, um, but we felt we couldn't really do. So you see here a Google image of the African continent, and what you can clearly see is, on a large scale, the transition from uh, a desert landscape to a savanna to a thick jungle. And it, uh, if, I don't know if any of you uh, ever like, like, join, um, like, like enjoy to uh, look around on Google Earth. I personally like to do that a lot, uh, reference gathering, etc. And I always enjoy seeing these, these beautiful transitions. Um, and they seem quite like, strong, but if you go up close, you can actually tell that these transitions are like incredibly complex. So there's all these features in the terrain that inform why these transitions happen. Um, in this case, where the, 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 the vegetation gets more lush, you see that the mountainscapes start to block the drier desert winds. Um, the water paths are the first areas where trees start to grow. 
And when you zoom into these areas, you can actually see how the terrain and how the terrain features actually start to inform these transitions. Uh, another example, I just had a, have a few examples to go through. Um, another one where the terrain creates these beautiful patterns um, of transitions in between different biome types. And lastly, wow, please, there we go. Uh, European Alps, where the transition in, in height actually uh, causes a transition from like a regular green area to like the snowy mountains. And these transitions happen over an incredibly large area. So um, let's have a look and go back at, uh, Hurst, to Hurston and I have a bit of a chat about the challenges we had. So uh, we were not really unhappy with the, the results that we were getting, um, especially up close. I think that was pretty good, um, especially considering the skill of our game. Um, but we needed a wider range of biomes. And we could only imagine, like, if you think about Terra Prime or anything that's, that's very complex uh, that we still want to do, um, we needed a system that worked smarter and better. So it became clear that our tiled approach uh, was making it really hard to, to scale uh, and create convincing uh, transitions. Help. Next slide. All right, so um, this is a very unflattering look of uh, Hurston. I turned off the atmosphere and some of the, the effects that usually go on top of this. But what we usually do, or tend, uh, did before, was paint a global texture that sort of represents uh, the different areas on a planet. So what we have here is on the pole, it's a bit desaturated, but that's where the savanna area meets the wasteland. And although it's, it's not super crisp, it kind of gets uh, the point across, especially with the effects layered on top of it. When you start flying closer to the surface, especially with all the effects turned off, you start to see where the global texture uh, starts to fill, and you get this blurry look, uh, the textures that are loaded locally for each patch of terrain where each tile is not fully loaded in, and you hit this dead zone in between where it just looks a bit blurry, a bit muddy, um, and it's not really getting us the results that we look, saw on Google Earth. Um, and then when you get even closer, you start to see the individual patches coming in. Um, the texture of the biome becomes visible, and although up close, this, this is a cool result, uh, especially when you're walking in and around it. Um, these transitions, yeah, they, they, they can be uh, quite hard. Um, so what you see here is a few um, wasteland tiles met, like meeting savanna tiles. And um, the artist and the art team had a really hard time just trying to um, alleviate these areas to get, get them as good as possible by creating additional tiles to sort of fit in between. And it, it became uh, quite complex to set up and maintain, especially with uh, more biomes and more variety coming in. Uh, and the drawback from the color map up close is also that it didn't quite uh, had the resolution that we wanted to. Um, so more complex man, uh, planets meant more individual files to maintain. Um, all of these collected assets informed the final look. So if you wanted to change a color on the planet, you had to go through all these individual files. Let's use the laser. So we had all these, um, these terrain files, these terrain sets. They had color information as well. So if we wanted the, the red on the planet to be a bit less red, uh, we had to tweak all of those individual files. Could meant it like over 20 or even more. Um, the overall look and final look of the planet was easily made up of 500 files that we all needed to maintain, uh, keep track of, and make sure that they were all in sync. So this, you can imagine that this makes uh, addressing feedback changes. Uh, whenever I'm talking with Ian about art direction stuff, it, it becomes quite tedious to get all that stuff uh, polished up and very time consuming. So we had a, a, to do a fundamental rethinking um, of how we want to approach planets. And the first thing that we wanted to do was separate the process or the idea of a biome, uh, temperature, and whether it's lush or, or dry, from the actual terrain shape. Um, and by this, we could keep our terrain library clean. And we don't have to uh, create additional color maps for every time we want to have a different color or a different type of terrain uh, showing up. So that way, you can get large um, changes on a global scale. Uh, this is not Google Earth anymore. This is V4. And what we see here are natural transitions that globally, uh, occur globally due to gradual change in temperature. Uh, humidity and weather conditions. 
And because um, these are occurring over a large scale, informed locally by the shape of the terrain, uh, every area where it transitions or uh, where a biome appears is informed by the shape of the terrain and is truly unique to that area. And we're no longer seeing a patch of uh, dense savanna trees and then next to it is the, um, the wasteland and you sort of see that stuff rep repeat. It's a large scale transition and everything uh, flows into each other. So we're no longer fixing a biome to a specific tile. And that way, across the surface over the, over of the entire globe, um, every area truly becomes unique. And this is a, an example of how extreme it could go with coloring, just as an example of some of the stuff you might see in the future. Um, just to reiterate this, this uh, the, another thing that we wanted to change, actually, um, is the blending, cross-fading, uh, transitioning between areas. And on the one hand, um, on the left side, we see V3 uh, zooming out. On the other side, we see V4. And bear in mind, so V4 is not, this one is not entirely done. We would like to paint a bit more, but we had to come up with an example. And what you see here is a seamless zoom out with no visual uh, artifacts or things changing or, or fading or popping. Whereas in V3, we still had a lot of transitions between all these layers of textures going on. Um, and you can even see that at some point, the V3 planet, if you zoom out far enough, this global texture kicks in. It's the only one that, uh, that remains. And it might actually have a completely different color uh, from where you actually started. And I'm, I'm pretty sure people have no, like, experienced this as well. You see a spot on a planet, you want to go there because it looks cool. You go there and it's actually a very different uh, color experience that you expected. Whereas at the, on V4, you can actually still make out the pattern the exact terrain shape that we started with. And I think this is a, like a big, big difference. OK, let's move on to it. <laughs> so um, those were the things that we really wanted to improve. And yeah, this one is another one that is uh, especially important for the team. Uh, like I said, managing and keeping track of 500 different files, doing color tweaks and all this stuff. It's become quite tedious, especially with complex planets. Um, so a very clean uh, file structure with library items feeding into one file that is edited, authored, and, and maintained inside the editor um, in a very uh, artist-friendly tool. So proof in the pudding. Um, Chris already spoiled it. Uh, V4 meant that all, all the planets that we've done in the last, I guess, two and a half years since we started shipping planets had to be updated to V4, uh, which was a bit of a, you can sit, you get a bit nervous from it, right? Um, that's a lot of work that we put into that. And um, it, it was the true test of how efficient this new planet tech would be and how efficient this tool would be. So I'm happy to confirm that the team has updated every single planet uh, for 3.8 to V4. And <laughs> this, it will be there. So um, just to get, get a bit of a start into the more technical areas, I just wanted to share a little bit what we do on the art creation side that feeds into what V4 does now. Um, Already for uh, the earlier version, V3, we used these uh, little simulation tools that um, one of our in-house artists, uh, Sebastian Schroeder, who had a big part in the v Planet Tech V4, uh, he couldn't make it, but essential input. Um, he made all these cool simulation tools that help us with terrain simulation. Uh, we see erosion, which is one of a very common uh, simulation that, we, that you would do with uh, building terrain. Uh, water flow simulation. Um, we see um, displacement of sand and soil based on wind input, and we see terracing. So these are just a, a few examples of the small little tools that we use in-house. And see, it helps. Um, up until now, these tools, they, we use them just as a, um, uh, like a personal thing, like you would have a brush in, inside your, your toolbox, and you just use it, and then you have an end result, an output that comes from it, and then we feed that into the engine. So we were able to get, like, at a, at, if you're at the right distance, you get these beautiful uh, terrain colors and, and terrain maps. Um, so we're not unhappy with that. But 
every time we wanted to change something or I wanted to make a, a different combination of colors or vegetation, you would have to redo it or make a new one. So instead of that making uh, final outputs and specific masks, uh, we decided to get those tools and simulate stuff and use the simulated data and feed that directly into the engine. So this was the old one. Uh, we had masks, we had color maps, uh, specific patterns where, we, where certain assets would show up. And we started to rethink, about, uh, rethink this and like, okay, how can we simplify this and make this um, easier for everything else to use? Um, so we decided to go for humidity and temperature. Um, it's, there's like a hundred variations of, of things that you can think of uh, that, that will cause transitions of, of areas and biomes, but I think temperature, whether it's something is hot or cold, uh, whether it's dry or, or very humid, or I think those are the two most important things. And if you look at some of the references that we looked at, it, even up close, the transitions are always happening because it gets colder, because there's water in the area, and even in desert areas where there's no water, those flow lines, they still are visible because if there is water, it will trickle down into, into those pathways. Stuff will sort of follow and get left behind in those areas. So uh, I think with those two uh, maps, we can capture a lot of interesting details. So this is the new set. Um, height, normals, just due to shading necessities. Um, flow maps and uh, temperature. So you can see in this one, um, let me just point that where the flow maps, where the water would flow, where water would accum accumulate in, um, in the valleys and on the height. It's a relative simple one. I think high, uh, the temperature is more important on a global scale. Um, but you see the differences in temperature if you go all the way up the hill or mountain. Um, to make sure that every uh, terrain set, every uh, height map uh, represents the exact same values with those, uh, with those flow maps and temperature maps, we have to unify um, all of our library height maps, basically, uh, our whole library of height maps. Um, and we made them all exactly four by four kilometers uh, with a maximum height of one kilometer up and then a maximum of one kilometer down. And the reason for doing this is that if we run these simulations on each height map, the data that comes out of that represents the exact same value for each height map. And this way, um, in the engine, we can actually blend these perfectly together and create this seamless canvas of data that, that we can paint on. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Ali, who will go into how that actually is handled inside the engine. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Right. So yeah, uh, to talk about how we make use of this climate data, uh, first I want to take a step back and talk about the different approaches to how you can build a planet. So I've got a, a, a line here showing all the various scales we need to uh, accomplish. Uh, and a typical first-person shooter, um, any old uh, average small game, uh, would typically be made of maybe two layers of textures. So you would have like your, your small ground textures and might be representing uh, millimeter accuracy details. Um, and that would type of take you up to a, a meter or a couple of meters. Um, and then they would have a next layer of texture, which would be their terrain. And you typically offer that something like a one meter resolution. And then that would cover your entire play space, so say a kilometer for a small game. Um, and that would typically account for about five megabytes of memory, depending on the tech you're using, uh, which is obviously nice and cheap in this generation. Uh, but moving on to something a bit larger, a large open world game would typically stretch for 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, or that type of scale, so 100 kilometers squared. Um, and for something like this, you're looking for about 100 megabytes if you use the same approach. So that's still quite sensible amount of memory, something you can easily achieve on a current gen console and definitely on a PC. Um, but that's fine, that's not what we're doing though. So what if we take the same approach and push it up to star citizen scale? Um, about 500 terabytes for a planet, so unless anyone's got some nice meaty SSDs, uh, you might be struggling there. So clearly that's not the way that anyone builds a planet. Um, so what about, uh, Marco talked about uh, procedural planets, like V1 was a, a, almost a fully procedural approach. It had limited our input. So uh, if you build a fully procedural uh, planet generation, what you tend to do is feed it with some very high-level data. It could be as simple as just the, the distance from the sun and the size, uh, the composition of the, of the crust, or it could be more detailed, like a, a map of the continents, things like this. 
Um, and then what you typically have is lots of layers of uh, complex noise and algorithms that would procedurally determine all the details you'd actually get on the planet. Uh, so it would all be driven by algorithms, basically. There would no artist has ever hand-painted a mountain. It would just come from the system, which sounds amazing. Um, if I just show, here's a very uh, limited, quick example to happen to show what type of a small terrain sim and how you start with something lumpy and then it turns into something uh, a bit nicer. I'll play that again. So that's a very small scale example. Um, so this sounds good. Uh, so with that type of approach, you can generate infinite planets, uh, which is good. You know, we get the whole solar system or whole universe filled. But actually, it's not as good as it seems. You, the variety you get is actually just limited by the complexity of the algorithm. So I could write an algorithm to say where rivers should spawn and how, how they should flow. And you might get a million different rivers, but you will never see a waterfall. And not until I go and then adjust the algorithm, add a waterfall. So you end up adding more and more layers of complexity, uh, which is fine. But at some point, especially with a game like ours, and you're trying to simulate hundreds of different planets that are very unique. You know, we don't want 100 Earths or 100 you know, lunar moons. We want lava planets. We want you know, all these radically different planets. So this approach doesn't really work for us. Uh, and what we actually want is something that's very art directed. You know, our art director Ian will tell us, you know, show us exactly what he wants like uh, a cliff to look like. It might be the slope of it, the shape of it, uh, the colors, and we have to match that as the, as the tech team. So um, doing something fully procedural doesn't really allow us to do that, and it becomes a very technical, uh, non-artistic process, uh, which is quite limiting. So what does Star Citizen do? Well, up till V3, we, uh, we combined four layers of textures. So uh, typically, we would use the first few layers you would get in a normal first-person game. Uh, but then we had these two extra layers of textures that would stretch us all the way up to the global type of scale. Um, and we blended all these together in the shader, and it cost us about 300 megs of memory, which is something that you know, most GPUs can easily handle. So that, that's fine. Uh, but like Michelle alluded to, um, it can be difficult to manage all these different layers and to blend them uh, to try and achieve the art direction at the uh, ground level, but then still to have a, a seamless transition to space. And there was always these hard decisions we had to make where if we wanted too much color variation on the surface, then on the, from space we maybe couldn't achieve it. Or there was this constant balancing act, so we need to do something here. So, the fundamental approach for V4 is to make use of climate data. Um, so we keep everything we had, uh, but rather than, like Michelle said, painting actual color maps, we now paint this climate data or simulate the climate data. Uh, and on top of that, we apply a global rule set for each planet that says, based on that climate, what would this planet do? Um, so this can tell you everything from what the color of the ground would be, whether it's sand or snow, uh, whether you might get a tree placed there or a rock. Uh, it, it informs us everything about the entire surface. And by using type of this top-down and top, uh, bottom-up approach at the same time, we type of overcome all of the limitations that we had previously. Here's a 2D chart of uh, temperature versus humidity. Um, Michelle mentioned we use these two, uh, these two properties because they seem the most relevant for most uh, variations on a planet's surface. But we're quite loose with the term. Um, the artists have a bit of flexibility what they put into them. And obviously, some planets or moons especially, maybe humidity isn't relevant for them. We, can, we could theoretically just use any other single measure we want for climate there. But the point is we've got two axes, two things we can control. So what we do is then for each individual uh, point on this 2D graph, we get to, we get to pick exactly what we want uh, to appear. So down here, we might have like, you know, obviously snow textures, where we have different types of trees appearing in the temperate rainforest. Um, we get to control the exact appearance at every single location within this chart. And we have 128 graduations of temperature and humidity, which leaves us with 16,000 vari variations we have to fill of to tell what would appear on the planet at that specific condition, which is quite a lot to fill. Um, but, so here's a quick demo showing how a uh, small terrain patch, just by adjusting the climate data, we can very quickly adjust the visuals. Uh, I'll just play that one again. And you see that we always get like logical shapes and colors coming in. There. So yeah, the problem with this now, it generates us a new problem. We've got 16,000 sets of uh, conditions we need to set up somehow. So 
for the artists, that represented quite a challenge. Our first uh, approach was for them to have, like, they would manually create these rules where I want uh, this tree to appear at this temperature range, and at this altitude, and it was, it was too unwieldy. So instead, we moved to a system where we literally paint the surface of the planet using like a paintbrush. So this is uh, a quick demo of this being used here. And because we don't want to paint the entire surface of the planet, when you paint on the surface, you're actually painting what you would like to appear at them climate conditions. So if you paint uh, somewhere that's 20 degrees C and uh, the humidity is 50%, you're actually painting every single point on the planet that has exactly those climate conditions. So by doing it this way, um, next slide, we can very quickly build up uh, very interesting biomes. And while it looks like you're just painting the small area of land in front of you, you're painting huge areas of the planet at once. Um, and this was something that was immediately appealing to the artists, because this is a very familiar workflow for anyone that's worked on a game engine uh, before, like a smaller scale one. Um, but yeah, it, it scales up for us. So here, we've just painted a few trees and bushes. And instantly, you can see the whole area is now being. Popular. I think everybody did a little happy dance when that, that moment came in. Yeah. And the, the paint tool came in. And so uh, when, we, when they paint all this data, it goes into what we call a lookup table, which is just that 2D chart. Uh, and we generate a whole bunch of different ones. So here's a couple of them, or three of them. Um, so we have the ground color, the type of surface that it might be, so snow rock. So that informs the physics engine of what to do there and what textures we should place. But then we also have things like tree coverage, so how much, how much trees would spawn there so that when we uh, at space level, we can still uh, draw the forests and draw the vegetation where typically most games would have to cull that stuff out. They just couldn't afford to deal with it. We can understand what the, you know, say if we're looking at the Amazon rainforest, we can understand what the color should be because we don't really want the ground color from space, like it might be brown in the rainforest, but we want the green of the lush trees above it. So we can generate all this data uh, and we can use it at any altitude and it gives us a lot of power. And also this rich information we can use for various other gameplay effects, which you'll see a bit more of later today. We saw a sneak peek of, uh, on our first demo of how temperature can drive things, but there's a lot to come with the, uh, this, these planet climate conditions. So here's, uh, here's a visualization of the climate on Selin. Uh, the red and green are just uh, visualizations of the temperature and humidity. And one of the lookup tables is shown there, which shows, uh, I think that's the ground color. So once we apply that to the surface, it starts to look a lot more reasonable. Uh, and then same for Microtech, we've got all the climate conditions there. Uh, it's mostly much snow and microtech, no surprise, but yeah. And then to build it up from the surface to see the other side of it, so this is purely just the terrain plus the global lookup table, so it looks pretty boring at the moment. Uh, once we apply some temperature variations, there's a little bit more interest. Uh, the humidity variations gives us quite a lot. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a um, medium scale type of uh, terrain textures, which are driven from the climate and the slope. And then finally, we have the, uh, the detailed textures. Now, our climate data is only stored at four meter resolution. So that doesn't give us you know, the, the individual stones and rocks. We have to add a layer of detailed ground texture. But we need them textures to look consistent with what the climate data tells us. So if the climate table tells us we should be having uh, yellow sand here, then we may need to make sure we have yellow sand. Now, we can't make a texture for every single scenario. So the solution for that is we normalize all of our ground textures so that they all have uh, an average of mid-gray color, which you can see in top left. Uh, and then we have uh, an average amount of bumpiness, which is the, the middle one, and the right-hand side shows the roughness. So they're all type of normalized, so they have this equal amount of, of, of stuff, whatever it is they're storing in that texture. And then when we come to apply it to the surface, we type of use a physically-based algorithm to rescale them uh, to achieve what the lookup table told us it wanted or what the artist wanted, but we preserve all uh, the details that are in the original texture. So in the color map, that might be slight hue variations, and in the roughness map, there might be like you know, pebbles and stones and sand of different densities and roughness. So this allows us to keep all of that detail, but make sure it's consistent. And that consistency is really important for us. We actually apply the same concept, as Michelle mentioned, at the four kilometer scale. So here's a very basic example of uh, a bunch of different uh, terrain tiles tiled up next to each other, and obviously there's a very hard join between them, but because we've made the climate data normalized and in the same range, uh, when we try to combine them together, we get a nice seamless transition, and then we apply the climate data rule set on top of that. 
then it feels completely natural. And it's, even in this very primitive example, it's very hard to see the transitions. And we get a very natural and logical progression from the terrain, which is really nice. Uh, there is one slight flaw of the technique, which is, uh, say, in this little highlighted box I've got on the bottom right, if I want to have a, a mountain range that's going to cover multiple uh, biomes, multiple climate conditions, uh, if I zoom out to space, I don't want to just get the average color of that region. I want to make sure to see all the details that would have been in there. So in this, I've got a, a combination of shrubland and snow and polar desert. So depending on how varied that terrain was, I should be seeing a mixture of them colors. Um, but just using the average color, which is what you would tend to get in the engine if you, without any extra tech, you would just get the color of that polar region in the middle, polar desert. So to solve this, uh, we come up with like, a statistical model, uh, which we call variance maps, which is shown on the right-hand side here, which is where we store the variation for, uh, inside a texture. So the left-hand side, it shows us the humidity of a particular patch of terrain, and the right-hand side is showing us the brighter areas is where the the climate is varying highly in that area. Uh, and then as we increase in altitude, uh, the hardware, the GPU hardware, naturally uses lower resolution textures and, uh, uh, to cover the, the smaller scale. Um, so then the variation map uh, then increases in brightness um, to cover the amount of variation that is within one pixel now. So as we go, now it's a uh, 32 by 32 texture. <coughs> You can see that it's much brighter now, and it's still the areas that are white now are the areas that had a, a lot of variation previously. Uh, and when it comes down to actually applying the climate rule set, rather than just applying the rule for the particular location of the particular climate data we have now, we actually use these variation maps to sum up an, an area of the climate data, uh, which we use the GPU's anisotropic filtering for that. And that allows us to sample all of the details that would have been within one pixel and make sure it's faithful to the original image. Uh, the, the, so that when you get down to the surface and you might have like, you know, 50% snow, 50% uh, grass, when you zoom out, you'll get the, the exact blend you would expect or an approximation of the blend of snow and, uh, uh, and grass. So yeah, that, that really helps us make sure that we have that consistent view from space and a nice softness. And it, it avoids the need to have a blend to some other texture when you're far away. So that's, that's the real key thing we get from V4 in my eyes. So I'm going to hand back to Marco now to talk about how we put all this together and how we, we turn this into a planet. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, let's have a quick look at the planet generation. So we are starting from a cube. Each cube phase is projected onto a sphere. The entire planet's surface is generated and rendered at different levels of details. And the amount of details increases as you get closer to the surface. Um, here you can see a debug screenshot showing the surface level humidity, as we discussed before. In V4, we are blending all nearby ecosystems for all terrain vertices using a bicubit interpolation approximation. Um, here is the same view, but we're showing temperature climate data. So and here is another improvement, as we mentioned, that we made in V4, is that object scattering is driven by the same climate data that we're using for terrain generation. Here you can see the object presets IDs, uh, driving objects spawning on demand. This is the same view, but it's showing the colors driven by climate data and textures. And here you can see the wireframe mesh geometry uh, generated from elevation data. The terrain geometry and blending is done on CPU. Um, this is the same view as before. We're showing the planet terrain without any objects yet. And this is the final view with objects generated on terrain. So we have a separation between large-scale ecosystems, which are the larger rocks, trees, and so on. And then we have the so-called ground cover objects, which are the smaller objects that are generated at ground level only. Um, additionally, we have improved the cliffside generation. Um, yeah, the objects are placed based on climate data and object preset settings. And we are using LOD clusters for large-scale forest rendering, which you will see in Microtech. Um, at ground level, we have additional parallax and ground texture details. So physics, the collision geometry 
is generated on demand on client and servers when players and spaceships are interacting with the physics grid. And uh, here in light gray, you can see the physics proxies that are generated for terrain, rocks, and objects. Um, so generating on demand, uh, physics on demand is tricky because the spaceships are actually moving at crazy speeds across the surface. And obviously, we cannot store the entire planet geometry in memories, otherwise it would be terabytes of data. So each terrain patch is built in parallel on CPU. The workload is distributed by the job system to all available cores. Um, basically, the server is building a physical collision mesh for each client. So we have um, many other features on the planets. For instance, caves. Here, is an, uh, here you can see an example of a cave assembled by the procedural layout tool. After generation, the caves are turned into object containers and they're placed on the planet's surface. So using object containers, we can take advantage of object container streaming in future. Uh, here you can see an example of a cave with an exclusion volume, which is used to avoid generating rocks on top of the cave entrance. Um, here is another example of exclusion volumes. You can see how the trees are avoiding generating inside the, the volumes. Additionally, we have uh, space stations orbiting around planets. All the space station interiors are generated uh, by the procedural layout tool as well, and then are placed as object containers in space. Yeah, another new feature we added in V4 is the frozen ocean, which can be seen here on Microtech. Uh, the frozen ocean is physicalized, and players can walk, drive ve vehicles on it. Um, in these pictures, we're showing the frozen ocean collision mesh generated on demand. So um, regarding mining, uh, the way it works is that some of the procedural objects are turned into mineable entities, and the player can interact with them and extract the minerals. And with persistency coming online, players are able to deplete planet resources, affecting the universe economy. So let's show some of the rework, which is coming with 3.8. I'm just going to let this run a little bit. Um, obviously, we wanted to at least close, uh, close this talk with showing you guys the current state of all the rework. Um, the team is, like I said, the team has been working hard and is still working at it. Um, we want to make sure that we deliver the best possible planet experience for uh, 3.8 coming up. Um, but we're already seeing a lot of the features that came in uh, with V4, um, making it everything, every location that we've known like or built up to up until now looking way better. Um, and it, there's there's a lot of subtle differences that might not be apparent in, um, at first glance. But we just wanted to reassure you guys, all the planets are updated and they will be coming. Um, so I, I guess we could already start thanking everybody who's been involved with this, um, because it's been, uh, to summarize, it's been a, like a full year working on this uh, with some very high level people and a lot of people involved with this. Uh, so this was not a, an easy, uh, easy undertaking. Yeah, it was a team of four. Well. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks for all the people on the organics team. Thanks to Marco, Ali, uh, Sebastian Schroeder, all the people on the graphics and engineering. And we hope you have a great uh, time with the new planets. Yeah, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.